Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Terrence Griffin, and I am the Director of Alumni Engagement at Rutgers University Newark. I want to start off by thanking you all for being with us today. Today, we are honored to have with us alumni from the Masters of Fine Arts program at Rutgers University Newark, serving as alumni panelists and speakers as part of our 75th anniversary of the Rutgers University Newark joining the Rutgers University system. Today's host will be Rigoberto Gonzalez, the director of the program. And please allow me a few seconds to tell you about Rigoberto. The author of 17 books of poetry and prose, most recently poetry collection, The Book of Ruin from 2019. Uh, Rigoberto, Rigoberto Gonzalez has also edited Camino del Sol, 15 Years of Latino and Latina Writing. His awards includes, include Lannan, Guggenheim, NEA, NYFA, and USA Rallone Fellowships. The American Book Award, the Lambda Literary Award, the Shelley Memorial Prize from the Poetry Society of America, the Lenore Marshall Prize from the Academy of American Poets, and Penn Volker Award for Poetry. Please note that tonight, all attendees have been placed on mute for the duration of the discussion. If you have questions for the speakers, please send them via the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. We will get to as many questions as possible after the speakers. It is now my privilege and honor to turn it over to Rigoberto. Thank you. Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and thank you so much to Alumni Engagement for sponsoring this incredible event. The Rutgers Newark MFA program was founded in 2008, and since then, our alum have published approximately 50 books, and that's in all genres, fiction, poetry, and nonfiction. Uh, 12, uh, 12 of our alumni are actually publishing books this year and next year, and we have four, four of those uh, who are going to share their work uh, this evening. The publications are already in press or uh, been published or forthcoming. So um, I'm going to introduce them all at once and then I'll individually present them with their books. Our first uh, speaker will be Ale Anna Portnoy Bremer, class of 2020. She is a poet and organizer from Puerto Rico. She holds a BA and an MA in, from the University of Puerto Rico and is an alumna of the MFA program Creative Writing Workers Newark. She is the winner of the 92nd Street Discovery Poetry Contest in 2020. To Love an Island was originally uh, the winner of the Yes, Yes Books 2019 Final 45 Chapa Contest. In December, it is released as a full length collection of poetry by the same title. She is currently working on the Spanish edition forthcoming from La Impresora. That's a copy of uh, To Love an Island. Tracy Fuad, class of 2018, her David collection about blank was chosen by Claudia Rankin as the 2020 winner of the AWP Dunn Hall Prize and published by the University of Pittsburgh Press in October 2021. She is also the author of the chapter, chapbook Pith from Newfound Books in 2020 and Dad, 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 Dad a number of dads, textbook, textbooks press 2019. A faculty member of the Berlin Writers Workshop, she is currently in residence at the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center. Antonio Lopez, class of 2018, is a poetician working at the intersections of academia, poetry, and politics. He has received scholarships to attend the community of writers at Squaw Valley, Tin House, the Vermont Studio Center, and Breadloaf. He is a proud member of the Macondo Writers Workshop and a Mundo Fellow. He holds degrees from Duke University, Rutgers Newark, and the University of Oxford. He's pursuing a PhD in modern thought and literature at Stanford University. His daily poetry collection, Pentification, is, uh, was selected by Gregory Parlow as a winner of the 2019 Levis Prize in Poetry. Antonio is currently fighting gentrification in his hometown as the newest and youngest council member for the city of East Palo Alto. And finally, Chesuayo Panza was a class of 2018, was born in Lusaka, Zambia, and raised in Chicago, Illinois. His work has been featured in New England Review, the Paris Review, Hampton Sydney Review, Lowell, Bird Feast, and elsewhere. 
He has received fellowships from the Bread Loaf Writers Conference, Hurston Wright Foundation, Callaloo, Kavakana, and Columbia University. A finalist for the Bruno International African Poetry Prize, a recipient of the 2017 Hurston Wright Award for College Writers, and winner of the 2020 Boston Review Annual Poetry Contest. His debut collection, The Reinhardt Frames, published by University and Rascal Press, is a winner of the Silliman First Book, Sillerman First Book Prize in African Poets. And I just want to add a note to say that I'm extremely proud of these four incredible uh, young poets. I wish them all the luck in the world as they begin their journeys into the life of the writers. Uh, so first up, please help me welcome Anna Pornoy Bremer, who's going to read from To Love an Island. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm extremely excited and honored to be reading here alongside Chesuayo, Antonio, and Tracy. Thank you, Rigo and Melissa, and everybody in the MFA program and the Rutgers University. Um, I'm going to be reading from my book, To Love an Island, and I will start with a poem called Strawberries. I'd always been told strawberries couldn't grow in Puerto Rico. We didn't have the climate up here on this finca, past the carcass of Peñuelas' petroleum past, where even hummingbirds are dizzy with height. Small strawberry studs slip off like beads from a necklace on my tongue. The farmer picks them gently from their fuzzy casing, warm and tender from swallowing the world's beatings as he shows us his budding coffee crop. Crecemos el café bajo sombra. I think of all the work we do in the shadows. Rearing coffee under the sun is hurried and stifles taste. Its flavor should be layered like the rock that makes this mountain, this mountain of an island. All plants are carbon husked patients, but coffee is a slow birth, bean of push that can take as long as four years to ripen. Intercropped with bananas, papayas, and pyrethrum to lure away pests, allow for just and solidary growth and abundant existence. This steep hill of harvest is everything we're slowly trying to become. The farmer says after the hurricane, they lost the majority of their coffee shrubs. Seeds were swept away with all else. Mass growers strike deals and offer seeds so local farmers can grow to sell back to them. We have to grow our own to be our own. He smiles, splits open a coffee pod, drops the pulpy body in my hand and tells me to try it. I'd always been told freedom would never come for Puerto Rico. We didn't have the climate. I asked the farmer about the strawberries. Son silvestres, he responds and points to their beautiful excess. Um, the next poem I'll be sharing is entitled Educación and the beauty of the MFA Rutgers um, Newark program. The MFA program of Rutgers University Newark is the cohorts that we're a part of. And this poem was actually inspired by a fellow um, classmate, poet, friend and comrade called Larko Mura. Um, so here goes the poem, Educación. Always swim towards an oncoming wave, then dive. Never swim against the current. Let it hurl you out to sea, then wade back ashore. The shore is lined with sargassum and sea grape, not littered. Don't litter the sand that straddles a leatherback's young. Leatherbacks leave for ocean and migrate years before returning. Returning will die on the airport runway, buried inside your ribcage. Your ribcage will resprout with return through graveyard soil. Keep mice away from the soil you pile into pots of ahi and white oregano. A good pot of white rice colors your lips with oil. Pour oil into the pot to pave it with pegao. Don't throw away pegao, the scraping hides resistance. Cats will hide hours before a hurricane. The eye of a hurricane opens the eyes of a people. 
The eyes of a people can grow clouded with Saharan dust. Saharan dust crosses the Atlantic, storms through windows of foreclosed homes. To occupy a foreclosed building is to step on a police anthill. The police will tear gas you because you fight for education. The police will tear gas you because you fight. The police will tear gas you. Tear gas washes off with vegetable oil, water, and palm olive. Watch water at your ankles. It could be raining upriver. El rio Guanajibo, el rio Mameyes will bathe you when your pipes and faucet parch. When you're parched for day's end, have a medalla, a beer. A medalla won't raise your salary or free Puerto Rico, but tonight it'll do. Tonight, listen for the strange music of sirens and chicharras. Tonight, imagine sirens lure to shipwreck away from your archipelago. Tonight, let news of your archipelago watch itself. Instead, watch for Dominicana and the Virgin Islands watching you, just as eager for your hand. Tonight, connect last year's Christmas lights and count all the burnt out bulbs. Tonight, from New Jersey, count the days till you come back home. I'm gonna be sharing two more poems from the book. Um, the follow one is called The Governor and the Cock. And just as a bit of background, in 2018 in Puerto Rico, there was a record breaking number of femicides and other variations of gender violence. And there was a lot of clamor to get the governor to declare a state of emergency and to sign a, um, an executive order declaring the state of emergency for gender violence in Puerto Rico. And those claims were repressed. And a few weeks after that, a Congress was discussing banning cockfights in Puerto Rico and the governor did stick out his neck for that. And so the violence of the ironies and the metaphors kind of just laid themselves at my feet. And so this poem came from that, the governor and the cock. A cis man is willing to go through hardest of lengths for his cock. The governor is no different. 24 women are dumped at the lip of some stream, a shaft of bridge. Feminists claw blood from police altars and sleep on cobblestone. The government whips out its ranks and sprays red fins to river. He won't sign their executive order. A hand comes down marble fisted on spurred island cocks. Trainers unzip their mouths, haul out their cages. A state of emergency is declared. He will fight to protect their cocks. Bush born and reared on stroke, their right to brawl is learned. Blows an act of cultural preservation, jabbing an inherited sport, a cock's training. He will defend the safety of their violence, plumed quarrels and thrusts erect to kill. Why change history now? This animal given nothing to peck but power, and power goes straight to the head. But the head knows as the cock crows and morning is forced out of bed, that the pit will erode to ruin the chopping block in its stead. And so I will finish my reading with this last poem entitled Ode to the Cacerola Combativa. A cacerola is a pot. Um, and it has an epigraph that reads, Me tienen miedo será, me tienen miedo será, by a famous figure back from the summer insurrection called the Cacerola Girl. Kitchens mourn your betrayal, passersby fold over their ears. You came to us south born like the winds, clanging your call over mountain ranges to fire, to front line, to freedom. You were combative way before you took to devouring streets, feeding peoples off the scrape of your metal, the burnt flakes of urgent ladle and boil. From rooftops and 20-story buildings, innermost wild grasses and tarped homes, you drowned out the evening sirens in warfare press conferences. The dents we dealt you bruised to music, turned steel pan, we played you to arms not and detriment, 
you chose an instrument of insurrection. Riot police marched on Kabul streets and you rang in the realization, nos tienen miedo, será. Nos tienen miedo, será. And so we shed our own fear. Tear gas hurt nothing like the tear we drummed through days of militancy against the boys club behind barricades inside the governor's mansion. Your cuts peeled back, scorched leaves, aluminum baby ferns unfurling to early sun. You, so glorious against the flames piled up along streets and storefronts, throbbing in our hands as we wage your transformation into weapon. Fierissima Cacerola, let your mangled face be remembered as we fight off the tug to return to this violent place we call normalcy. Mm -hmm. Thrum through lull, play us insistent and enraged. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Anna. Next up, please welcome Tracy Fuad. Hi, um, thank you so much, Rigo. Um, and I just want to say quickly, thank you to everyone at Rutgers, um, Rigo, Brenda, Alice, Jim, Kathy, and Melissa. Um, you're all somehow in this book. Um, and thank you, uh, Chesuayo and Anna and uh, Antonio, it's an honor to read with all of you. So a few months after I graduated, um, I moved to uh, Iraqi Kurdistan where my dad grew up and um, that's where this, this book came together. Um, so the first poem I'll read, um, I wrote on the plane. Iraq badge panic. You could say it wrong, like my racked brain or with the wrong G, like gag or garament. Some words are nearly in runes. Yesterday, the gynecologist told me I spell my name wrong, should have an O between the F and U. Am I trying to get pregnant? In my country, he begins, and then between my parted legs, tells me that over there, they do everything that we do just behind closed doors. Am I anxious? Well, someone is tweeting at me from a burner account or my step grandma's trying to troll me again. But I've already gone quick violet. On the plane beside me is a healer who tells me about her interest in belly dancing. Belly good is what my grandpa says instead of very. Not his accent, just his joke. We approach the Fertile Crescent, Haler, Kirkuk, Baghdad, three neon shocks. Across the aisle, a woman opens up a document that just says art, then selects the text in baby blue and makes it shrink. Timing, says the healer, such a powerful force in life. This is from a section of the book called Eject to, to be read aloud by a robot. But in this situation, I'm going to read the poem. Banned from shipping to Iraq. Vitamins, herbs, knives, Viagra, and communistic materials. Still, I Google, can you Amazon to Kurdistan? While in captivity, Saddam was plied by family-sized bags of Doritos for which he had a penchant. What about experimental theocracy? When the world was more ancient, perhaps it was easier to hear the music of flowers. What else has dimmed in our heated efficiency? I'm looking to come to a compromise with my object so we stop doing harm to one another. But the stones here hum between wake and sleep, a soft little ballad for home. 
Beneath my skin, I'm sure there is other fabric that I am closed all the way to the core. Someone is taking off my outermost. Someone is mining the ancient veins. Was there ever a country called Kurdistan? I forgot to say the last, the last line in the poem is uh, from one of those suggested questions that Google always gives you. This is the shortest poem in my book. www.curdchat.com Beauty has joined the room. Beauty, hello? Beauty has left this room. Okay, um, I think everyone can relate to this poem. Every day I get exciting emails. Every day I get exciting emails. I receive an interesting email every day. Every day I got an interesting email. I got an interesting email every day. There is a nice email every day. Every day has a good email. Every day you have a good email. You have good emails every day. You have good emails daily. You are good for us every day. You are good every day. You're fine every day. Hi everyone, every day. Hi everyone, every day. Hello, every day. Hello, every day. Hello, every day. Thanks, every day. Thank you, each day, daily, every day. Every day, the day, the day, 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 a day, the sun, 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 the sun, day, 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 day. Okay, I'll read two more, two more, e two more poems, not emails, <laughs> two more poems. Terms of syllogism. I was sure that being in between meant being nowhere. Certain there were scissors that could cut me off the grid. I hoped there was a key, but was sure the void was serious, virulent and spreading. I was sure alone most of the time. And surely right on some accounts, a logic that left me pounding. Was intimacy by nature grotesque? Those intimate with me were divided. Where was I, young and running with my mother in a drenching rain? Sometimes all that's left of what I've lived is cinema, kinetic and anonymous like it could have been anyone's memory. The ambulance carrying my father at three in the morning struck and killed a black bear. The beast wore death spur in my father's place, had to be hauled off the ribbon of road before the vehicle could pass. I know there is a door in the exact shape of my body that when I go through, I will know by how acutely it licks my perimeter. On the phone, my mother tells me, island, that is where I'll go when I am gone. Be certain, I tell myself, to be ready for the door when it opens. And I will end um, with a love poem for my Sweetie, who is zooming from Berlin at a very midnight hour. A color named after a fruit. Before oranges were sweet, they were bitter. The whole world was bitterer then. Nights unlit, weak 
wild, each element bound in its own rind. And then you were there in the rift cut out of mountain, your mouth with its triangle window. In the garden, the branches were dropping their blossoms, then bending with citrus laden with sun weight. We could sit and watch the fruit go orange, that hue that moved through five tongues to get to ours. Let the moon go ochre, your milky teeth soft at my bared silk, a hummed line, the thrum of the primary colors beneath the pit, the pulp. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tracy. Up next, please welcome Antonio Lopez. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to start this. What's good, everybody? Hope you all staying safe. Your family and loved ones are doing so too. Uh, really an honor to be here with everybody virtually in the Zoom Mundo, Tracy, Anna, uh, Cheswayo. Um, it's, it's just a joy to share the written word with y'all. I'm really proud of our cohort. Thank you to Rigo and thank you to everybody making this event happen. Um, I can't think of no better time to invest in the arts. And so help us keep fertilizing that imagination. So here's my tribute to that possibility. I'm gonna be reading four poems from my book, Hintification. And, you know, poets sometimes use banter. It's a very clever way of filling in time and also to explain your work. So uh, I'll just briefly say that the book is a lot of things, but Hintification is a syllabus. It's designed to teach you about the speaker, AKA me, my life going from Title I school into the academy, into the higher education. Um, and so you get graded throughout the book. So I'm gonna read to you this first poem is called Grading Rubric. Grading rubric, trauma is weighted as follows. Formal essays, 55 to 65%. Write children of immigrants, 10%, double if undocumented. Write first generation, 15%. Mention the color of the Coyotes van, 10%. Keep family in the past tense, 5%. Write birthplace next to its murder per capita rate, 20%. In class, 35%. Don't correct them when they say your name wrong, 5%. Go by Tony starting sophomore year, 10%. Stay quiet when they make fun of Keisha, 5%. Believe Tim when he says, you just got in because you're 10%. When it's your turn to read, pronounce it like they do. Guatemala, 5%. Participation, turn to the person next to you. Debate your belonging, 10%. This next poem is called ESL. And the way it's structured in the book, it's part of what's called a documented based question or DBQ. Those may you who came up through high school, took AP US history, had this test called the DBQ. And so instead of using uh, like actual sources, well, sources from like World War II, proper American history, I'm using the sources of like the actual speaker. Um, so this source A is called ESL. After Roger Reeves, Roger Reeves, Simothia Exeguia, ESL. The tongue as a debut ribbon to slice and applaud to lose consciousness and wake up indoors. When the smell of cooked chicken creeps into your nose and teeth remember what it means to chew. To make the mouth a gully for the first pale stranger who cradles your head and says, drink. When the glistening neck of his canteen prods your lips and words you've never heard raid in. When the names of the room's dead fill your throat and bedloads of migrants cover their children's mouths each time they knock. When loose threads of tongue fall on your stubby fingers and soon you unravel how you arrived here to mourn the Jordans hung on telephone wires, the muscle memories of a coupe that stopped mid street. A tinted face lowers the glass curtain and suddenly your pickup games one man short to still hear his jump shot. When the court chuckled at his elbows locked in and 21's just a game never an age reached. 
when the pale stranger invites his neighbors, how they marvel at your mouth's archeology. span When wives, pods rot and decide to form book clubs around your grief. When a smile lurks in the corner of your jaw as they proclaim you their latest myth. So the book oscillates between kind of examining this very individualized journey of this, you know, lack of a better word, tokenized kid coming from, you know, what we can call the hood or ghetto body, what do you want to frame it and going to these institutions. But I'd be remiss if I didn't say the book is equally about ex a survey of the community, you know, examining our struggles or celebrations, the people down the streets, the paleteros, the, the guy on the liquor store, the, the pastor. And so, you know, it has this kind of, in as much as it rebels in the eye, I'm also trying to talk about the we, right? And I feel like a lot of poets of color, you know, whether they're narrative or lyric, however we want to classify it, they told that line. Um, and so this poem uh, is called uh, The Disciples of San Mateo County, California. And I thought a lot about what it means to canonize something because canon comes from the Bible, which is this idea of it, the, the meaning of it means like a measuring stick, the thing in which you used to measure something, but it has a spiritual quality. And canonize also means to render something a saint. So even in literature, there's this sense of religion, religion, even if we don't talk about it, what we deem as worthy and sacred enough to read and study across classrooms across the West and US and all that. Um, so I thought about what would it look like if we were to canonize us, like people I grew up with, who ostensibly weren't part of those, those texts in classrooms. Um, so this poem is called The Disciples of San Mateo County, California. And God said to Juventino, perform ablution over the bathroom sink. Press the cold metal with novice palms. Stretch out your double white tee, the cotton bullet proof vest where upon stepping in the schoolyard, your face juvenile punches. Brace the iron gates with knockoff Cortezes. Cuff your sagging dickies by the ankles. Saunter through the cracked voices of boys who laugh without a tag for their torsos. Unzip your father, your brother's fur jacket and take father's flask. Drink from his Patron. Shadow box the heavy gavel swings with swigs of your own. Cleanse yourself and liquors, kerosene. Let all fla let flammable spirits purge all nerves. To be an acolyte, embalmed in hair gel, worshiping the altars cordoned off in caution tape, is sainthood. And I'll read one more poem. And thanks everyone so much for having me again. So again, I think with. The book is titled Hintification, and part of the root of that is thinking is gentrification, right? This thing that we recognize very well, even in Newark and all parts of the US. And a lot of times it's look at this negative force of erasure, it erodes, it gets rid of the things that we grew up with. And so a lot of times, like I think as poets, at least certainly in this book, not just artists, but archivists preserving, trying to capture those memories before they are lost by the forces of modernization, keeping things upscale. Um, and so the book is at pains to capture those landscapes before you know, the folks are either pushed out or they leave this world on premature grounds. Uh, so the poem is titled Triptych of the Adobe Kata Army because I don't know if y'all remember, but you know, when you look at the old history documentaries, they teach you about the Terracotta Army, right? This, this army that is guarding the emperor's tomb um, in ancient China. And I thought about a lot in our, in, in some respects, what if we took that mythic lens of antiquity, of, of classical civilization and superimpose it on like the urban landscape on communities and hoods all across the US and gave it that same sense of grandeur. So this poem is called Triptych of the Adobe Kata Army. And Triptych, just for y'all nerds out there, it's an art history term, divide panels into three. So there's three sections and I'll pause in each section that we all know where it's at. Triptych of the Adobe Kata Army, East Palo Alto circa 2000 AD. My fingers are desperate, 
to unearth the ruins of my countrymen, only to find a Tesla on the second floor of our apartments, now a parking garage. The Amazon logo smirks above me like a biblical cloud. Out here, hooded saints tore the covenant of earthly silence, passed out zigzag leaflets to preach the gospel of skin, whirling dervishes and long white tees, bum rush me at a bautizo, pressed against my lips a cholo's chalice. My chest flushed at watching boys bronze into adobe kata. A driveway floodlight, the barrios moon cast their bodies as they placed bets against the armors they carried. A fist tucked inside a hoodie, his knuckles spelling the names of ex-lovers. Each letter tatted with a paper clip, cocked belt buckle whose color shouts the block who he fucks with. Until asphalt swallows him again and Maria's now mourn Jesus outside a sagging fence. Wreath as chain link with lit candles, cardboard signs saying, we miss you, streamers without the heated balloon that promised flight. Consider the clothesline as a bandolier, slung over ruined soldiers whose uniformes still cling onto apartment balconies. Que encendieron sus tierras to raise the wrinkled flags of blusas and neon vests. Consider this Aztec sacrifice. A father offers an empire, his daily flesh, kneels on the melted tar of its tongue, winces at the body turned legal tender, all to nurse the newborn with this vision. Una vida mejor. And so father cradled my head inside asphalt, prayed for our right to simply wait. Thanks so much, y'all. Thank you so much. Please welcome our final reader, Chesuayo Panza. Hey, everybody. It's a blessing to truly be here. Uh, should I say everybody who's made this possible uh, to be reunited with my cohort uh, virtually, uh, hopefully in the flesh uh, next time, but it truly is an honor. Uh, I'm gonna be reading a couple, four poems, four or five from the Reinhardt Frames. And all I'll say is that the book is an intersexual relationship between Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and the Iranian cinema um, auteur Abbas Kiristami. The first poem is Autour Poetica, and it features a um, it features a, a quote from uh, Stefan Malamar. It is not description which can unveil the efficacy and beauty of monuments, seas, or the human face in all their maturity and native state, but rather evocation, illusion, suggestion. Autour Poetica. Considering modern poetry, I look to my garden. Outside my window, the snout butterfly feasts on my flowers while approaching the end of its fortnight, staining its wings with the pollen of perennials and flocks. Not the butterfly's beauty I marvel at, but how it comprehends its dimming hours, the skill in living. The flowers know something about this, how beauty is of dissonance to the sentimental, the poet's voice still and absent, understanding the ethereal nature of the line's breath its inconclusive possibilities, aside from our abuse of its frame and projections on the page, conflating affect as synecdoche for craft. The poem is a pure thing. Each writer finds a new entrance into the mystery. Each line melody is strands concocting their own cadences, meaningful folds, slight tears at the seams, how a line can be naked without being explicit, we tore petals from monocots, put them between our lips and press secrets into them. The images is where dream. To build the voice as an individual instrument, to fashion a new air where breath becomes superfluous. And the next poem is, a, is an ecrastic poem um, in conversation to Abbas Kiristami's film, um, Taste of Cherry. 
Taste of Cherry, Abbas Kiristami, 1997. On a drive with Mr. Badi in his 10 Land Rover, silence grazes our ears, leaving our mouths half open, our throats letting out small clearance. The roads ahead wind into Mobius strips, Mr. Badi's hands loosely grabbing the wheel. I look to the rover's tinted windows, wondering if we appear like Schrodinger's cat to other drivers, but I know it is the ostrich syndrome holding my silence when he asked me to pour 20 spadefuls of earth on his body in a hole he dug. On a street, discreet as our intent, searching for Mr. Badi's perfect burial, the lakefront scent curls around us, retreating me to sore summers. The tension I developed against water after a friend drowned, a pack of boys tightly bound as a tin of sardines, the soda cans in brown paper bags we carried to give us the mysticism of winos, the weights of slaughter and sun and funeral home sign tugging at our collars, a death has occurred or is near. The brown and orange liquid we poured on fish combed by waves to shorelines, their bodies brazed by seagull beaks, eyes sinking into their skulls. We stuffed half lit loose cigarettes inside them so their musk would not offend our noses. I don't want to give you a gun to kill me. I'm giving you a spade, Mr. Badi says. Just pretend you're farming and I am manure to spread at the foot of crops. We reach a stoplight. My eyes expand to the bus that ran over the neighbor's daughter, the mother running to scatter limbs, attempting to sew back the southern child. I stared in wonder, thinking it was possible. The city is a burial. Why do you choose to live? Um, the next poem I'll read, uh, is frame six, which is a central uh, featuring uh, a lot of a lot of poets uh, who are actually here. Uh, so thank you to Brenna Shaughnessy's work. Thank you to Rico Berto's work. Thank you to Kathy's work. Frame six. These days I wake in the used light of someone's spent life. I am often a stranger to myself. I have no place of origin no home, I keep remembering everything in two time zones at once. Who knows, maybe I myself am called something other than myself. Not so much a name, but the result of a name. It's a strange sensation to yell out, this is me. In every place, I've watched caravans of sorrow. I run like all the other men, chasing my shadow down alleys. Sometimes in the spaces, there is fear, my mind deepens into them. From calm to fear, my mind moves, then moves. In light, part nightmare and part vision fleeing. The voice rises on a storm of grackles, then returns, have elegy, have serenade. I'm gonna read two more. Um, getting lost with how Miyazaki and Satoshi Khan and it features an epigraph from um, Hao Miyazaki's 2013 film, The Wind Rises, uh, when uh, Giovanni Battista Caproni is speaking to Hiro Horikashi. The epigraph is, be careful, this may be a dream, but you can still lose your head. Getting lost with Hao Miyazaki and Satoshi Khan. It all happened so sudden, or has it always been happening? The trigger from a woman's sight at the farmer's market, which sent me on an impulse inward into the convex vestibules of memory. My wandering through the past, all the endless doors marked, et cetera, which felt like veiled entries into tragic addendums of living. My pondering over what other ways can I speak of the shadows of the past. Umbra makes them sound beautiful. Before I attempt to speak, my mouth snatched from me burning secrets the tongue salivates over. An attempt to scream from the eyes, but they only become witness to the trails of smoke I chase to find the origin or departure of my journey. How do I get back? Hitchhike the train swimming across water where passengers look like shades of me or castles moving in the sky 
some flowers spilling from their sides, the wind sneezing a light breeze to plant them in small valleys, perfect shades of blue and green, demarcating real from surreal, the shy ghosts and ghouls, monsters paid to play minstrels of themselves, the boogeyman with a wife, kids, and a mortgage. Be careful to dream too much. Your imagination can destroy their homes. Try existing as a guest wherever you are. Then I want to return to a place I can believe in, but the imagination holds all my anxieties. When life is moving so slow, it is trying to spit you into some place elsewhere. The life you know is camouflage. A voice or touch can appear as a cruel phantom after being alone long enough. When I listen to my breath to believe I am alive. There are doors we could lead you to, but you must not mind the dead. Don't trust the ground, your body either. If anything, learn to mistrust yourself. Some of what we remember becomes fragile with time until they become constructions out of our own desires. Notice the tulips smell like daffodils. The mind is projection. You ever think our imagination intrudes upon other worlds? Our reality of fanatics craze dreams? Consider we too might be someone's a red construction. But if I succumb to the imagination's fold, will I have a song like the Kawaii o -O to ricochet from his fantastical graveyard to sear my voice on times' his ears? Here's the way out. The destination is the same in that you are always arriving and departing part of you. Turn outward. Where are you now, but where you have always been? The last poem, frame 12. A sort of shout out to everybody in here. Frame 12. Everything has form. Dusk with its desperate colors of erasure. The hollow unearthly hour of night. The lullaby of shadows. Unleashing arduous scintillating silences. The flavors of tongues, apertures. I've imagined it all and the stretched out ends our lives make. I am an addict or the human comedy, the very dirge, the luster of something. This is my other heritage, to forget the impossible weight of being human, to settle into the flesh of our futures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aswayo. While we're waiting for Antonio, Tracy, and Anna to join us, um, I want to uh, shout out the undergraduates, uh, students here in attendance who are part of a creative writing minor. I've had the for good fortune of visiting four of their classes, and I can say the conversations, the interactions there were truly inspiring. Also, we have our, our MFA program, uh, current class of 2022 and 2023. We're also here. And so one of the things I want to ask uh, each of you was to maybe speak uh, briefly about a, the most valuable experience you had while in the MFA program. I'll just call on you, Anna. Hey, okay. Um, I think the most valuable experience or experiences I had in the MFA program for one was like building community. The community has followed me even after I left the MFA program and the relationships I built there have just been so valuable to me as, as a writer, as a poet, but also they the friendships have really fed me as well i found comrades in the mfa as well for all the political work that i do and a, the mentorship that i received in the mfa program as well from figures like rigoberto himself um, that have also um followed me after after i left the mfa program and just the overall support that we continue to receive and give each other so that for me has been one of the most valuable things yeah. tracy yeah, I mean, I, I want to echo that. Can you hear me? Okay, um, just to echo what Anna said, like the, the friends I made who I continue to exchange work with. Um, and then a very specific answer, which was at the end of the two years for Brenda's class, we put together this little packet of about maybe 20 pages of poetry and we got feedback on that and that, open so much for me because it was after two years of really focusing on individual poems I started to think about my work as a whole and um it still took a lot of time for that to like cohere into a I think a, a book that worked but 
beginning to think about that was really uh, pivotal. Antonio? Yeah, uh, piggyback off of that, like I think also one thing we have to emphasize too is the level of diversity is such an overused word, so I would say range, like the range of the, the aesthetic skill set, like how can you do a poem all these different beautiful ways, like Tracy, I remember like when we shared the copying, teach, the teacher's copy for the writing program, and sometimes all y'all's poems would still be on the bottom, and I would be like, shit, that's an amazing freaking poem, and it's like, it's just this long strophic, so I think it's like people my age, but from different walks of life coming together and really centering, taking tears of their life. We're coming from all different backgrounds, all different experiences, and we're here for the love of the game, love for the word. And I think for me, I came into the program being like, well, I like writing. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to see what happens. And I think from the beginning, Rigo and everybody set a standard of like, we're, we, can be, we can push ourselves to be better and better than we ever thought that we could. And I think to do that in two years is extraordinary. And I think it's a level of rigor, but also of warmth that is unique. And I don't think can't be rivaled by any other institution. So I would say like the level of range in terms of the communities we serve, the reasons why we write. I know I was talking about the politics as well that's embedded in that, in that process. But I think more importantly, the warmth of the community that we were so part of, each and every one of us were good friends would hang out afterwards. And so it's not just on the page, it's off the page that we keep those conversations to keep that community alive. And I think that's one of the reasons I still write to this day to write into that community. Thank you. Swayo? Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I was thinking about what Antonio was saying about diversity and it is this often romanticized hot button word. Um, but I, I would definitely say that just as like a black person in the world, uh, especially in creative writing, you are very much rewarded for like just being black, <laughs> you know. Uh, and I think the value, uh, the 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 value that I had from speaking with Rigo, shout out to John King, uh, speaking with, to uh, Kathy Park Hong about how is it that sometimes we can romanticize or exploit our own experiences as people of color when we're writing for the gaze of like uh, white readers and white writers. So I think for me it was very important to understand that like, you know, I don't have to write these poems uh, that are very much fabricating or exacerbating this idea of what my experience was like as like a black person growing up in Chicago, uh, coming from Zambia. So I think for me, it was just very, very invaluable to have had those like heart to heart mo moments with uh, John Keane and Rigo to just really be like, yo, you're basically black facing on the page right now. You should just, <laughs> you should chill. Thank you, Shisoy. Uh, I'm gonna take a few questions from our audience members. Uh, one of them uh, stood out for me. And this is somebody asking, how do you navigate uh, imposter syndrome as a writer? Anyone? I, I just unmuted myself because when I was teaching at Rutgers, my last name is Fuad, and um, students would always turn in papers that said Professor Fraud on the top. <laughs> And I was like, they know. Um, but it's, it's, it is real for me. Um, and it was hard. It was hard to come to terms with like that my book had been met even with success. Sometimes I had this, this fear like, oh, I tricked them or something. Um, so really taking care of yourself and I think staying grounded with your friends who, who know your work, whose work you know, um, and like staying grounded in, I think what Chesaya was saying earlier, working on the next project. Um, so always coming back to why, like why you write. I think it's a huge shift to go from this inward facing thing that maybe you've done for years on your own and to suddenly have it be in the public has been, uh, yeah actually challenging so I think it's a really um it's a good question and I think something everyone feels with at some point you just want to chime in on that I think just to add to Tracy's comments and similarly I think echo them one that I think it's an ongoing process addressing and dealing with that too I don't think it's it's not over for me and I don't, I don't think it's over for many people um and also just 
I think the importance of being able to identify um, imposter syndrome or feeling like a fraud in relation to what standards as well and being very true or staying very true to your values as you write poetry and trying to hold on to those and hopefully that those are also places that you can return to as touchstones um, when you have those kinds of mm -hmm. biting insecurities around that as well. Yeah. Antonio. It really well said. I'm happy to chime in as well, but first, hey, Kathy, what's up, Kathy, Farcon? Uh, I just want to say bye to her. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say is, uh, <laughs> I got to give the shout out. Um, it's, it's, it's just, I think I think Rigo, like just you being t you you're a testament to it in terms of not to gas folks up, but it's like we're here having this conversation going like speaking back into that that gaze. And Rigo, I have vivid memories of you talking to us in workshop, like how you had to come up was different than our generation. And every generation is mobilizing and improving the conditions in which we can produce and publish so that you know it's no longer the cocktail standing, you know, read my stuff, read my stuff, it's submittable, it's so I think it's important to understand that it's not a static process, that each one of us is not a, just an individual success, but in insofar as we're humanizing our narrative, shaping that narrative and talking about a community, even if it's just about that person, we're fleshing out, there's a politics to that and it's eroding and challenging that imposter syndrome. And also, you know, not to get meta or beyond that meta conversation, it's like finding your people and knowing that you're part of a community, that you're not alone in it that you have people your age, your generation or beyond asking those questions. So if we're all asking imposter syndrome, then what does imposter syndrome mean at that point? I don't think it's not just a syndrome. It's a, it's almost like a zeitgeist of like, of course you have generations of people who haven't seen themselves in literature and now are suddenly, you know, flourishing, right? We're in a golden era of poetry as people have said, and we've been there for quite a long time. And so I think that presents the opportunity for us to really look at ourselves, look at the community and have a new paradigm, have a new way of looking at um, what, what it is we do and why we do it. So I would, I, being an optimist, I'm like, this game is changing every year and it's absolutely because of the advocacy that happens behind the scenes and in front of it. So staying positive and staying optimistic and just leaning on people that affirm you and like just what I was saying, challenge, challenge your poems. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, you. they're not just ethnic or racial, but they're like, they're doing something with language. Yeah. Just why you want to chime in on it? Sure. To get matter about imposter syndrome. In some of the bodies that we occupy across different intersections of being, some of us already feel as if we're perceived as imposters of being human. So for me, imposter syndrome does not necessarily halt me in that sense, because it's sort of like a double meta physical experience of like understanding that you are already supposed to not feel validated in the body that you occupy. So therefore you have to just keep countering that with your presence alone, as well as like keep going with your writing. And that's it. There you go. Uh, one more question. And this is uh, kind of connected. The two questions are connected. Uh, one is where do you find inspiration and how do you deal with writer's block? I'll go. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and I think this just goes back to this idea of like, you know, you know, when I was in undergrad in Vermont at Middlebury College and, you know, everybody was like praising these poems for like just talking about what it's like from Chicago, you know, but it's really, I think for me, like my writing now is more so research based. Uh, most of the poems in the Reinhardt frames were based upon me reading copious amounts of books, uh, internalizing images, cinema, and then really having conversations with myself, with my peers about what do those things mean in connection to my identity. So I think it's, I think inspiration or writer's block comes from this idea that you have these moments of inspiration that strike and you write. But I would urge people to think about how is it how is writing uh, a practice of um, really delving into other forms of reading that help you explore the possibilities in which your imagination can dabble in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'll, I'll, I'll follow up on that. And I think going back to just praising our people, giving our roses, like Tracy, one of Tracy's poems about the permutations of the email 
And it's like, I thought of the the poem with Terrence Hayes and it's like the new year, like, I don't forget how it goes, but it was like, it's it's a good year, new year, hopefully. Hopefully it would be a good year. And so it's like the poem as teasing out language and being playful, not, not, not taking yourself seriously all the time, or if you are, it's in a different way. So I, to what just while I was saying, part of dealing with writer's block is like, de like debunking this idea of like, it's this mythic moment on the page, but it's a daily practice. It's a labor. It's like gardening. It's like anything else you do. You do your taxes, you go, you go check on the mail, you go pick up, you know, your friend, your little brother from school. It's like art has to, art is integrated in our life like that. I mean, it's just capitalism telling us that it's not, it's like just as much as breathing. And the more we can normalize that as part of our craft, the better poets will be because poetry isn't this distinct ephemeral thing. It's like an extension of who we are. You know, like jazz people talk about their instrument. It's like we talk about our instrument, the human voice. And so I think just reading people who kind of spark, like just what I was saying, being a voracious reader, really reading all kinds of stuff to keep you, your mind active and curious about what language can do. So even if the subject matter is really tough and macabre and difficult, always holding this almost childish love of imagination and language is so crucial for the process. And just highlighting and hailing people that do that for you is, is, an, is an essential part of your, your ingredients as a writer. Thank you. Tracy? Yeah, I really have a, a similar idea. Again. Can you hear me now? I am unmuted. Um, I think just following your obsessions, like whatever is interesting to you, just like going you know, 120% in that direction. Um, whether it's like researching or just really like going all in on what, what's interesting to you um, and going beyond, even if maybe there's not like space for that thing in your opinion in poetry, like you can kind of write about anything. So nurturing your own interests and obsessions. Thank you. Anna? Yeah, I mean, aside from echoing everything everybody said, right, how to treat writer's block to be able to push through it and continue writing, I also think that for me, it has been important to think about and learn that writer's block or an impasse can sometimes uh, be a warning sign that we should pay attention to that can lead to burnout as well. And I've also, I think, been gradually training myself, of course, to recognize those moments and to recognize them as opportunities to feed other parts of my life that are also lacking and maybe take a step back from writing. Um, and, and yeah, feed those other parts of my life and allow also not writing to be a part of my writing process as well. And think about all the ways that I can bring more experiences and be out in the world um, that will hopefully, right after I take off, I, after I return from that break from writing, will also feed and pour into my writing as well. Thank you so much. So we come to the conclusion. Look at this bundle. What a distinguished uh, group of poets. And thank you so much. Yes, everybody. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. I think Terry is going to chime in here uh, at this moment to uh, bid us adieu. But it was such a pleasure to hear everybody. I'm so proud of all of you. And come visit. Thank you so much, uh, Rigoberto, and all of the readers are still holding up their books. Please, I love your uh, book. Melissa, yeah, please do. Melissa shared in the chat links for each individual uh, book, so please do make sure that you take advantage of these opportunities and 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 uh, support these writers. On behalf of the RUAA uh, and Rutgers University of Newark Alumni Engagement, thank you to our alumni uh, for being featured today. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Be safe and have a great evening. Bye-bye now.